kick off the service, huh? So our worship team is, keeps growing, um, and it's amazing. And, uh, and they've, the neat thing about it, folks, two things, and I mentioned it in our prayer this morning before, as, before the service. One is that these folks really are talented. They have some real gifts, and we are blessed to have so many of them in one place at the same time. The second thing is, is that they have the right spirit. They have a spirit of love for the Lord, so the things that are coming out of them are genuine. They're not perfect people, close, but not quite. But, but they have a real desire to serve the Lord and use their gifts for His glory, so it's not about their glory. And so that's, that's the right attitude, that's the right spirit, and that's a blessing. So we are blessed. Well, I want to mention a couple of things. Uh, as folks come in, I'm going to mention to our ushers just that you're, you're welcome to be a little proactive this morning uh, if necessary, okay? We do have some open seats here this morning, but last couple of Sundays it's been kind of packed out, and that's exciting. So if you don't mind having people sit closer to you, then we'll probably ask, can, can you move over a little, or can somebody sit closer? Uh, because we do have some pews roped off, of course. But we don't want you to feel like someone's invading your space. So if you're someone who'd rather not, you can just kind of keep your mask on or just kind of... Uh, kind of Keep your distance, and we're, we'll honor that, too. So we're trying to make sure that we can get everybody in here comfortably as well as make you comfortable while, while you're here. So just I mentioned that at the beginning. I'm excited this morning. We've got a young man who's going to open our service for us, uh, and you know him. A number of you know him, Kyle Shaughnessy. Uh, Kyle was in this school at one point uh, at TNT School. He has uh, six other brothers, uh, and uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, wonderful parents, but Kyle and I and Seamus Comstock, Ben Chermani, we've been meeting together for a number of months and having some good times as the Lord's working in their lives, and uh, so I've asked these young guys at different times, they're going to be sharing to open our service. I remember how nervous I was when I was 16, 17, for the first time speaking, uh, and so uh, you can imagine what that might feel like if you were the one up here. So give a smile as, as, and listen as Kyle's going to share with us open our service this morning. Kyle. Bless you and bless you. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, like Pastor Dan said, uh, I went to this school for a couple years, ninth and 10th grade. I've got a couple older brothers, Zach and Jared Shaughnessy, who also went to the school a couple years. Um, and then also to his point, we've been doing a Bible study for about eight months now. We started back in February, and he calls the Bible study Leadership in Development. Um, so it was probably about two or three weeks ago he mentioned the opportunity to come up and share one morning. Um, and I really was kind of excited by that. I mean, if it's a leadership Bible study and then you're presented with the opportunity to lead something, I felt like I really should do that. So I was pretty excited, and then driving home, it just hit me like what I just agreed to. And I started to think of all the people in the audience and how many people I respect um, and respect what they have to say here. And then I was just like, oh my gosh, like what, what can I share? What can I say? Whatever. Um, and the armor of God has really been on my heart lately. So I was like, I've read through the chapter, but I was like, okay, I'll read it again. Um, and the verses that stood out to me were actually a couple of different ones. It's um, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. And it says, Paul speaking, and he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And these are the two verses that really stood out. And it says, And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Um, so this really just stood out to me because Paul's praying that he may be given utterance from God, that he may share the gospel boldly as he ought to because it is good to speak because it was given to him by God. So this started just really giving me a confidence, like, Lord, if you want me to share something, give me that utterance, and then I'll share boldly because I ought to speak it. And then another verse that went along with that is uh, John 10, 27. It's my sheep know my voice, and they... Uh, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I was like, God, like, I want to know your voice. Give me an utterance. So I began praying that prayer throughout the next five so days. The next week, I just 
daily, like, Lord, give me an utterance, give me an utterance. Um, and then one day I was at work, I work at Shaw's, I was stocking shelves uh, in the cooler, and behind me, I th it was pretty loud, I mean, it was a Saturday afternoon, a lot of people, I was in the cooler, pretty loud, and behind me, I heard my boss call my name. Uh, she's got a very distinct accent, so I heard her, and I turned, and she was standing about 50 feet away, and she had just called my name the once, um, and I was like, I thought that was kind of strange, so I started to walk towards her, and she goes, no, no, I didn't want you, I just wanted to see if you could hear me, and she kind of laughed and walked away. I was like, that was weird. So I started to walk back to what I was doing, and then it just hit me. It was like, she wanted to see if I could hear her above the noise. It wouldn't have been impressive if I could hear her if the store was quiet. And then that really just hit me in a, another verse that I was thinking of uh, that Pastor Dan always shares with us. It's uh, Colossians 1.18, and it's speaking of Jesus it says, and he is the head of the body in the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Um, and it's talking about preeminence, that God reigns supreme over everything. Um, and that includes what we hear. And I was like, and I just started to really feel like the Lord convicting me, like, Kyle, I know you can hear me on Sunday mornings, but can you hear me on Monday mornings when you don't get, want to get out of bed? I know you can hear me on Wednesday nights, but can you hear me on Friday nights when you don't really want anything to do with me? Like, can you hear me in all things? Because I have preeminence in everything. So can you hear me above the noise? Um, and then just one last point. So I started... I started to think of instances where it was difficult to hear God or people heard God in difficult times. And uh, the one that actually stood out to me was a physical example of where it was difficult to hear. And it's Matthew 14, 27 through 29, and it's Peter when he walked on water. Um, and it says, so the disciples saw Jesus walking on water and they were afraid. Um, and it, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come under the water with me. So he said, come. That's all he said. Just once, come. Um, and I started to think of that, and it just, like, hit me. And it was like, what if Peter was unable to hear God above that storm? He never would have known to get out of the boat. And I just wonder how many times in my life I'm stuck in storms, and the Lord has said, come. But I couldn't hear him because I was too focused on the storm. Um, so I'm sitting in boats that God doesn't want me to, that he's called me out of circumstances that he has called me out of, but I'm stuck in because I can't stop focusing on them. Even later on in the story, you hear Peter does get out of the boat, and then the wind scares him, and he takes his eyes off of Jesus. Wind isn't something you really see with your eyes. It came in his ears. The wind scared him. He took his ears off God, so he took his eyes off God, and then he sank. Um, so I just really felt like, if you, yeah, you got to keep your ears on God. In all things, he has preeminence. I felt like it's not just enough to know what God's voice sounds like. You have to be able to hear it in difficult situations and apply it. If you want to be a leader, you can't just hear God Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or Monday night at Bible study. You have to be able to hear him in the mundane. You have to hear, be able to hear him in all sorts of storms, the storms of um, whether it's political noise, whether it's uh, family noise, whether it's any type of things your friends want you to do, you have to be able to hear him in all things because he does have that preeminence. Uh, and that is what I had to share. <laughs> and then um, I'll just pray to open up the service. Um, Dear Lord, uh, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the opportunity to um, come up here and share. Um, I pray for the service, that um, it will be received with open ears and an open heart. Uh, just bless the worship and bless the message. Um, I pray for us all throughout this uh, congregation, throughout the following weeks, um, that we will have an open ears to, to hear you, and that we will give you that preeminence you deserve in all things. And if uh, there's something that is, that is blocking us from hearing your voice, that we will address that thing. Uh, you deserve that preeminence, and we should be able to hear you in all things, in all circumstances of life. I pray this all in your mighty name, God. Amen. Amen. As the worship team is uh, preparing to go back to their seats, and you're looking at this first part of Psalm 2, just before we read it, there are certain passages in the Old Testament that more vividly describe the Trinity in the Old Testament prior to the incarnation of Christ when he came as a babe. It is a heavenly vantage point of what is going on on earth. 
It answers the question, why are there so many nations and people in turmoil? Why does it always seem that there's some kind of scheme for a one-world globalist movement? And how come there has been so much turmoil since March? God, you have your way in your word. Let's read verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. You may be seated as we begin. God created every individual, regardless of how they act, regardless of their behavior, regardless of the reactions, whether they're at home, in the streets, or anywhere else, God has created every single human being in His image. We don't always see the image because of sin. Because we're conceived in sin, sin mars the image of God. Unless there's a solution to reduce the effects of sin, there will be continual Problems that are unsolvable. The scriptures are clear that sin in people causes them rage. And sinful people influence, and in some nations, very few, get the chance to elect them, but sinful people who cannot conquer their own sin will then elect sinful people. Now everybody's a sinner. The answer is not, how do we simply get rid of sin? Now, obviously, as a Christian, we know the remedy. But it's imperative to recognize this, that sin and the fall, the fact that humanity fell into sin, is the source of all the rebellion in the world. Why do people imagine vain things? What's the vanity that people imagine? That somehow, tomorrow, I'll figure this out and be able to deal with this myself. Somehow, we can solve the problems of the world without God. Somehow, we can just try harder, be better, and then get more determined to solve the world's problems. Now, I'll just give you one clue throughout all of recorded history. If you dethrone or you don't want the God that is, you'll recreate a God that you want. And the God most often recreated throughout history is the government. It's the state that becomes an idol and a God. If there is an idol, and there are many, in this nation, one of the biggest idols on both parties in both areas is the government will solve the problem. I declare to you from the power of the Word of God, only God can solve the problem. Now it goes into some specifics in these verses to begin our dilemma. The kings and the rulers of the world, the Bible says, take counsel together against the Lord throughout all time. Now that word counsel in Hebrew is only used two or three times in the Bible. It does not mean simply give advice. Hey, uh, let's... Let's rule the world instead of God. Let, what do you think of that? No, this is a word that means you plot a strategy and you plan a foundation for a world government. You strategize for it. You prepare for it. 
The Hebrew word means you lay a foundation to try to get it to work. And the scriptures from the heavenly vantage point says, there's nothing new about the rulers of the world wanting to run the world. There's nothing new. They take counsel together against the Lord. But the Bible also says they take counsel not just against God, but against His anointed. Now, against Christ, we know it. We know that there is a specific war against Christ and His name. 1 John 4, 3 says, And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is already in the world. The spirit of Antichrist is a greater danger than some individual. Because I tell you right now, the spirit of Antichrist moves against Christ. And the Bible says that has been there from time immemorial. And then it's not just against God, but against His anointed. Now hear me, hear me. I'm speaking from the vantage point because of the Word, from heaven looking down on earth. The first section of this psalm is simply the cry of the earth to heaven. How come there's continual wars, rumors of wars? How come there's continual problems? How come it seems so organized in evil? How come it seems like the turmoil never ends? How come vanity, the same situations that were tried in B.C. are tried in A.D., they're tried in every century, every decade, and they've never worked? How come they keep being tried? Because of the sin and the rebellion that's in all hearts and why we ought to cry out to mercy that we avail ourselves of the divine solution for the sin in our hearts. What is His anointed? Now I know that the Bible does refer to certain leaders in the Scripture as His anointed, but more often it refers to the people of God who are the anointed. As the Bible tells us in Psalm 28, 8, it's the people of God that are His anointed. So how does the structural demonic kingdom from the beginning attack the people of God? Hear me. There are two ways. He does it. A cry comes up. How come? The answer comes down. He said this. But the enemy says, we will cast aside their bonds. In other words, the enemy seeks to divide his people one from another. The first strategy of the enemy to get rid of the people of God's influence. He can't get rid of the people of God. But to get rid of their influence is to divide us against one another. From petty offenses that grow into redwood trees to all kinds of defenses that come to split Churches that ought to be in agreement because they agree about who Christ is, who the Word of God is, what sin is, then what keeps us apart? What keeps us apart is pride. It's ego. It's my kingdom, not yours. All those things. And those bonds that, do, that unite the people of God, the Spirit of God that moves to unite His church. I'm not talking about obliterating differences. God is not upset that people go, uh, go to different churches. That's fine. That there are different leaders, that there are differences between certain nuances in theology and all that. That's not what the enemy's concerned about. The enemy wants to make sure we don't work together in praying and reaching the culture in which we live. If we he can divide and conquer. But now here I want you to understand the second thing. The second strategy is, he said this, to cast away their cords from us. Hear me. There is a divine cord, a divine connection between the condition of God's people and the condition of the culture. He said, look, 
We want to cast aside the connection the people of God have with us who want to rule the world. So what we're going to do first is convince the people of God there is no connection. So we're going to convince them, first of all, no, you're not to have any responsibility to the culture in which you live. You just want to get out of here. You just want to leave the world to the devil. Let God take care of the church. Let the devil take care of the world. It's not our business what happens in politics. Not our business what happens in the economy. Who cares? Let's just, we know Jesus and we just pray that before it gets too bad, we get out of here. I'm telling you, that's demonic. The second coming is not demonic. He's coming. I'm talking about the fact that the cord gets separated. So now, I have no responsibility to anything that happens here. I can remain isolated, thinking it's just me and Jesus. But look, the scriptures make very clear in the same book that identified the spirit of Antichrist, that book makes it very clear. If you say you love God, but you cannot relate to your brother or your sister, you're a liar. You don't really love God. In fact, the only way our devotion to God gets confirmed is by our responsibility to our neighbors. And that's just not Christian neighbors. That doesn't mean you go out and you say, you, they've got to become a Christian, I'll shake them. No, you'll, you'll end up someplace else. That's not what we're talking about. But here, it's the cord. Can you see that there's a strategic, throughout the nations, breaking of the cord between the church and the culture in which it lives. Listen, the way the churches were named in the New Testament were divine. The church of Laodicea, the church of Ephesus, the church of Thyatira, the church of Pergamos. Why? The church is delighted city. So the enemy comes and cuts that cord. Says, don't have any responsibility to it. Don't have any unity among yourselves. Folks, voting is one of the most minuscule but imperative responsibilities we have toward our culture, especially in this country. And you can look at the Republican platform and the Democratic platform, and that's important. People generally, not always totally, agree with those platforms if they run under those labels. Not always completely. But then you've got to look at what the person believes. But you see, we're not... The Christian kingdom of God is not Republican, not Democrat. It's kingdom. It's not left. It's not right. It's up. And therefore, we vote kingdom values in the ballot box. But voting is the very minimal. It's like a kindergarten step forward. It's more important that you develop relationships even to those you disagree, with whom you disagree. What do the people who disagree with you say about your demeanor and my demeanor? That's the key. What happens there? Folks, we have to invest in those relationships. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to uh, Nathaniel. Let's go to verses 4 to 9. Let's stand up. It's going to help you keep awake. Let's go to, to, to verses 4 through 9. What's the response of God to the cry of his people? What's going on, Lord? Let's see the response. Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. You may be seated. So in every time period, every century, there have been individuals and rulers who have plotted and strategized 
some of them for years. We're right now in the midst of, in our area, our nation, there's been a 100-year plan to dethrone this nation and take it down. A structural plan. A plan that I could show you. A plan that's documented. There's all kinds of stuff that's undocumented. But, there's, that's, but that's only the natural. I don't know all that plan. I spent seven years of my life studying it. With such obsession, I had to put the books on a section in my shelf and not look at them for a few years. Because it's like looking at the plot of hell. But now you don't have to trust me in my research, just turn on the news. But I want you to know, first of all, all the individuals that have wanted to rule the world, that have wanted to, well, think of it. The first world ruler was Nimrod. He was not only a mighty man before the Lord physically, who knows how tall or big he was, but he had united almost all of humanity when he built the Tower of Babel to have one centralized, top-down global government that would be in complete control of every person's life. We know enough about the history of that. That it was an affront to God. But there was a remnant who believed in Jehovah as the only God. And I want to tell you that the Bible never condones any government above the nations. He is the Lord of the nations. He is the king of every king, the Lord of every Lord, and therefore any government that tries to rule over the nations is not of God. It's not his kingdom. In fact, what did God do? Nimrod looked like he was going to succeed, but God who confused them and worked it right into his plans for the many languages. Oh, you won't scatter in obedience to me? I'll make you scatter. And they couldn't understand each other, and they left and spread, and they left off the tower, and Nimrod could not complete his diabolical plot. But he's not alone. Nebuchadnezzar, remember old Neb. He wanted to rule the world. He was that most populous fortified city in the ancient world, Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar was ruler. You know the story. And then God baffled Nebuchadnezzar and he had to have a skinny teenager come and interpret his dream called Daniel. He was only a teenager at the time, but then on and on it would go until finally Daniel, he was able to interpret dreams that blessed the king. That's always good to have that as the precursor. Because there were later ones that were not going to bless the king at all. Oh, you are the one God will cut down because of your pride. And a year later it happened. And he became like an animal for seven years. They even had a medical name for the disease that Nebuchadnezzar appeared to have for seven years. And then when he came back, he had his sanity. In other words, he wanted to rule the world, but God stopped it. Not only that, we can look at Belshazzar. Here he is about ready to rule again in Babylon and he is using all the sacred utensils from Jerusalem. And he's about to have it. It's done. Daniel is now an old man in his 80s and he hasn't been sought officially for 25 years. But he's still alive. And the queen, Nebuchadnezzar's wife, goes to Belshazzar when the writing comes on the wall. He says, I know someone who can interpret this. Go get the old man. In comes Daniel. Do you really want me to tell you? Your days are numbered. And when he was saying the words, Cyrus was already in Babylon, only a few hundred yards from Belshazzar. And the moment Daniel said, it's over, Belshazzar, way out of shape, overweight, no preparation, walked out to a slender soldier, Cyrus. The battle did not take long. Folks, let me tell you, 
There's always been the plot to rule the world. There's just one thing they always forget. God. But it's the one thing in our day we must remember. Otherwise, we will couch in fear when we watch the news. We will say, it is all gone. It, it is all gone. And then you'll have obsessive language. Of course, this election is important. But I dare to tell you, biblical principles are more important. And local leaders you vote for are more important than the president. Because God designed his kingdom from the bottom up. But you'll be obsessive to the place. And people will exaggerate all kinds of things. But we need to remember these things. So there was a meeting in heaven among the Trinity that we get a glimpse into here. We don't know when it was. Could be probably eternity past. And here's the Father and the Son. Now the Son is called in theology the eternally begotten Son of God. Why? Because he had no beginning. He didn't really have a birth. Yes, he had an incarnation physically, but long before that he was God. And therefore, he is one with God, but he's eternally begotten of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the executive that carries out all of the plans. And here we see there was a discussion. Can you imagine, and Father God is saying, can you imagine? Really, Nimrod, you're going to take over the world? <laughs> that is funny. You don't know God. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to rule the world? That is a joke in heaven. Not on earth because people suffer because of it. Oh, Belshazzar, you're going to drink your wine to intoxication, violating the laws of God and desecrating the temple and all its utensils? No, not going to happen. Not only that, we could go on. Alexander the Great, he conquers the known world. He's 33 years of age. He sits on a hill and starts to weep because there's nobody else to kill. Nobody else to be able to conquer. And he's done it so rapidly and mysteriously when he decides he wants to be God. He has a strange heart attack and dies at 33. You know, when I teach world history, I would tell the students, here we go again. A guy who is about to be successful, but God. And they have a discussion. The father says to the son, would you be willing to pay the price in order to have these nations that want to all work against me become your inheritance? You already own everything. But now, due to sin, there needs to be a redemption payment. There needs to be something done that the nations can become your inheritance. And then Jesus and the Father agreed and the Holy Spirit clapped. And in heaven a decree was given. Let every king that wants to rule the world, let every global organization that wants to dethrone God, let everyone, today, yesterday, and many signs, when you all know this decree, the decree has already been made. My son is king over the holy hill Zion, and he will inherit the nations. The decree is done. There is no one that can undo it. Nowhere will it ever change. Jesus is King, he is the ultimate judge. Now, and that's worth shouting about, and that's better than the news. Because that means God is one, he's not only going to win, he already won. God only chose one nation in ancient history, Israel. But now every nation can choose him after Christ has come. They can choose him by the condition of God's people, if they're salty enough, influential enough in their nation's history, they could cause the rulers to actually decree that God's word is the basis of the laws. That Jesus can be the king. It's got to come bottom up, not top down. The answer is not going to come from the White House. The answer will come from your house. The answer is going to come from us declaring that he's king of kings and lord of lords. That's why it becomes so clear that the death, the resurrection of the Savior, 
is so imperative, the gospel, because he died for you and I so that he could come and live within us. He brings the kingdom inside. This is the only inside out, bottom up kingdom that has ever existed. Every other one is top down, centralized. You have to go to a palace. You have to pay the protocol. You have to go in. You have to come in the, best, the right way. You have to go in the, the correct way. And then you finally get close to the king. The farther you are from the king, farther you are from your rights, farther you are from who you are, not in this kingdom. The king comes in. And from and then God builds his kingdom. So folks, we need to remember not only why the nations rage, we need to understand the decree of who owns the nations. And he is Lord of every nation, whether the nation acknowledges or not. He is not up for election. People vote all the time. And heaven laughs. Oh, we have it now. We have it. There is a sense and I will say prophetically, there is a sense right now since March that the enemy in the spirit, and you can see it in the natural some, that this is the closest they've ever come in our lifetime to getting the whole enchilada. This is it. We have it. The U.S. goes down. Look, I've talked to leaders in South America, Central America, Asia, and other America, and they tell you on prayer calls and everything else, we are praying for America. Do you know there's a prayer cell in Australia praying for America? There are prayers all around, prayer groups across the nations because they say in the natural, if you go down, we go down. Where will people run? The martyrs in the Middle East, they bury their loved ones who have been tortured and killed. But America to them is the place where heaven just kissed earth. Because you're free. Okay, stand last time. No, you'll have to stand to leave the building, but I mean, stand right now. Verse 10 to 12. Let's go. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Okay, you can be seated. Be wise, kings and judges and leaders. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Isaiah said it this way. All those who hear the word of the Lord and tremble have the fear of God. What do we mean by tremble? Are we to be afraid of God? We're not afraid of God in the sense that he doesn't want good things for you. But we fear the consequences. All across our nation and around the world, there are leaders that do not fear God. We're at the lowest ebb I've ever seen of no fear of God. We don't care what God says. We don't care if there is a God. The problem is this. The consequences are becoming evident. The consequences are going to be there and he says, look, kiss the sun. That's a sign of respect. That's the idea. Acknowledge that God rules. Folks, I understand. There are godly people in government. And I am so thankful for the prayer meetings, like the ones where we're, we're, we're advertising the return. We're advertising the one that's being uh, filmed right here in Plymouth. We're advertising those prayer meetings for God's people. But a solemn assembly that deals with the nation has to be called, according to the Bible, by civil rulers. I don't mean the others are ineffectual. But we need to be praying that the consequences become so strong that even the strong pride in our government will be, we need God! And our own policies, even the right ones, and our own declarations are not enough to solve the problem. We need God. The Caesars of Rome, 
all thought they were God. God showed them differently. They're all dead. The Illuminati birthed at the same time America was birthed, soon to be called Jacobins, sought to rule the world. The actual final papers that were going to seal the threat and the doom of the French Revolution were on horseback at midnight as James Robinson began riding on his horse to deliver those secret papers for the establishment of a one world order in order to backlash against the American Revolution and kill it. But at midnight, a lightning bolt struck him on his horse. He died and the papers were strewn on the front lawn of a patriot farmer who published the entire thing for the world to see. I got that book, by the way. But anyway, the point is, you know what? They almost had it, but God. On and on we could go, and it's not good that I even start it because I'm an historian. We could talk about Napoleon, who got so proud that when he became the leader of France, he grabbed the crown from the Pope, put it on his own head, laid hands on himself, that I don't need God. Well, when a leader does that, there's a Waterloo coming, folks. <laughs> on and on we could go. Today, the globalist alliances bringing organized chaos to our streets. That we might cry out for anyone, please, whoever can stop the violence, we'll just give you the power. No. They think they have it. But God. I think the same God that has ruled throughout history still rules now. I think the same God that has stopped it every other time will stop it now. Yes, the spirit of Antichrist is here. Yes, there's a movement. I know all that. But I, this is what I do know. You and I need to take our place in the church. Find out what we're called to do. Do it unto the Lord. Make our mark in our neighborhoods. And no longer fret about what's happening everywhere in the world. And stop taking those burdens as if they're our own. Now I don't have to say that this church may not need to repent of the isolation extreme because we've been preaching this for 40 years. But this church and others may need to repent for the obsession with thinking the whole culture lays on our shoulders. Oh my gosh, what if this person loses the election? I just reminded my wife the other day. I said, you remember when we taught our kids when they were a little young and we'd go into the ballot? And I had taught them, you know me, I told stories on all the candidates. Who do you think we should vote for? They said home. And they would, they would say, oh no, this person, yes. And I remember when Jonathan and Shauna came, they were young, you know, maybe five and eight years of age. And they said this, Daddy... How come all the people we vote for lose? <laughs> and when, when, as Charlene laughs, I begin to go, how are you going to handle this one? But God, because I said this, we do not lose when we vote our conscience. You may lose one of the battles, but we will win the war. Because the war is not won and lost just in a ballot box. Expression of conscience means if we can express it there, we'll speak up when we need to speak up. We'll say something when something's got to be said. And we'll trust God. Folks, trust God that He is still in control. Trust God that they think they have their plans. He's got a better one. He outsmarts them. He overcheckmates them. He's got, uh, uh, he's got things, he's got pawns that turn into kings. He's got moves they don't even know about. He end runs. He's everywhere. And in your personal situation, whatever you face, God can outrun it. God can outduel your enemy. And he is your warrior. You do not have to be the best and the brightest, the strongest and the smartest. We need to trust that God is King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's why what we believe, the essentials about what we believe that I have rehearsed 
with you on who is on the throne and who wins is what we need to be reminded. As this song is played, just be reminded again. The words are in your bulletin. But be reminded again that it is the Lord that is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Listen and ponder and be uplifted in your spirit before we close. I close with this. Listen. The word of God. Know this. In the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, denying its power, from such turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into houses, make captives of gullible women loaded with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. But listen to the end. But they will progress no further. For their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. Go today and trust that God is allowing evil to be exposed, that its folly would be clear to all. Because everyone thinks evil will go on forever. No, it will stop because God will know exactly when to stop it. As an intercessor going into their prayer closet in the nations just recently had, she said, I saw a vision. And that, listen, visions and dreams confirm the word. We don't follow them. They follow us. But when they came, they said this. She said, God, what is going on in this nation who had a covenant with you? And all of a sudden, she saw a vision which was biblical. And that is God the Father standing there with Jesus. And the warrior angels cannot stand when evil is running rampant. They're ready to move. At any moment. But God says, no, not yet. Holding it back. It is not the devil that's winning. It is God that simply says, not yet. Not yet. I will have a perfect time when it's going to be declared to all of exactly what I'm doing. So remember, trust him as you leave this service. Trust him with your heart as we heard in song, and realize He is King of every King. He's Lord of every Lord. And when the day comes when the last trumpet sounds, it's going to be out of victory, not rescuing a defeated, soiled church that doesn't know what it's supposed to do. God is going to raise us up, train us up, and mature us. All that you see happening is simply a spiritual gym to teach us how to lift heavier weights, how to deal with bigger opposition, and do it with humility and brokenness before God, knowing it is not the people that live around you that is our enemy. It's not even the people in the streets that are causing such havoc that are our enemy. We know who the enemy is. May God instruct us, empower us, to go with this revelation. This is His word from heaven about what goes on on earth. Amen? Amen? Praise God. I pray for each person here, Lord. I pray that you'd touch them, that you'd t t teach them in their innermost being to trust you when it appears nothing can change it. We thank you, God, that you're in control. And we expect a phenomenal outpouring of your power, your wisdom, and your deliverance. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray this blessing over you now as we go our way. It is the Arianic blessing, and it's beautiful. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, may this be true now 
throughout this week and forevermore. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Walk in his blessing this week. By the way, folks, there is an offering plate at the door. If you'd like to contribute to the ministry of the church, please feel free to drop your offering in as you go out today. Thank you.